Welcome everyone. Just give us a few seconds to get everybody into the meeting and we'll get started. A lot of our, our friends here joining us. I'm so glad to see all of you tonight and so glad that we are accustomed now to doing our meetings virtually since it's so doggone car cold out there. <laughs> and I had a hard time venturing out, Jean, even for you and Heather, but I would have done it. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Heather. <laughs> All right, let's see, we have everybody in here now. I think we pretty much let the majority of folks in and I want to thank you for coming. My name is Yvonne Brannon and I'm chair of Public Schools First and joining me tonight and helping me moderate the meeting is Dr. Terrence Ruth. You can wave, Terrence, yes. Um, and so we're very um, happy to have our distinguished speakers tonight. Um, this title of our workshop tonight, The Persistent and Pervasive Challenge of Child Poverty and Hunger in North Carolina, was recently published by Jean and Heather, and we immediately wanted to share um, this information with all of you. Um, Jean says in the very beginning of this presentation that these are the twin challenges in our state, child hunger and poverty. And this cold, um, night where our governor has warned us all to stay inside and gather up food um, and uh, it brings this issue really close to our hearts. Schools council tomorrow, a lot of kids won't be eating. It's going to be a long weekend. So the weather has kind of brought a chill over me and I'm looking forward to the um, information being presented tonight and hopefully we have time for a discussion. So let's talk about the man who needs no introduction uh, but I will introduce him anyway. He's very accomplished, the Boyd Tinsley Distinguished Professor at UNC. He has been president of William & Mary. He was law dean at the University of Colorado. He's been dean at, at UNC for six years. Uh, last, a couple of years ago, we all had the um, privilege of, of reading his indecent assembly, the North Carolina legislature's blueprint for war against democracy and equality. The Faces of Poverty in North Carolina. If you have not read this, you do want to read it. It's very related to exactly what we're talking about here tonight, but it's a very humane and personal look at a lot of our citizens. He says stories from our invisible citizens. I'll let you um, read more on his bio here, but we are so honored to have Gene with us tonight. And he is joined by his colleague, Heather Hunt, also an attorney, uh, currently, she is the research associate with the North Carolina Poverty Research Fund. She looks at and documents the intersection of poverty and equality and economic development um, and does so with um, such great um, in insight. Uh, she was assistant director at the Center for Poverty Work and Opportunity. Prior to that, she worked at the UNC Center for Civil Rights. She has a strong background and knows from you know, uh, these issues uh, from her years of work and research in this field. So a quick overview of what we're gonna be doing tonight is that Jean's gonna start us off looking at kind of an overview of the intergenerational mobility impact of issues around Leandro, which he'll explain later, food, family, food insecurity. Um, Heather is gonna look specifically at COVID and the pandemic and what that impacts had on the family. Um, and then we're gonna have the authors, will do some concluding remarks. And then we wanted to have some time, we wanna save some time to let all of you share your thoughts or ask your questions. And of course, um, I will ask us to have a few minutes at the end to talk about, you know, so what's, what's next and what can we do um, as concerned citizens? I, I, have the permission of Jean just to show a couple of quick slides before we would just turn off our slides and let Jean share with us. Um, this is a chart in his report that shows from 1969 to the current time 
of the poverty rates in North Carolina and the US. And I think I just wanted you to have a visual look at, at this, um, one in five, right? And North Carolina has um, been closer to the US average in some points, but we are right back where we started 50 years later. This is a, a, a chart that Heather and Jean had in the report that I had to sit and look at for quite a few minutes. This really looks at the last 20 years and you can see uh, what race and the impact that has on child poverty. You can see the white Asian children on your left and we move forward to more races, black, Native American, Latinx, other races. And you can see how that goes up and goes up rapidly and dramatically. Um, this chart we had earlier, it was on your screen when you came in, but I do want you to kind of put this back in your mind right now. We, you know, we were sitting there in Wake County, 8%, and, and you can look at the counties around us in these metro areas, and then you can see the startling issues that happens in the, in the, in the east, in the south of our state. Um, one last slide before uh, we ask Mr. Nichols to share it with us. I want you to just look at this for a few moments and kind of absorb it. Look at the column that says percent change. And look at the total number of poor children, 54% increase. Go a little further down, the total number of poor children in high poverty tracks, 109.8% increase. The very last, next to the last, total number of children in very high poverty tracks, 40% poor or more living in that area, that track, that 253.5%. This is the shame of our state. And this is what Jean's going to talk about right now. Thank you very much, Yvonne. It's uh, an honor for uh, both Heather and I to be here. Uh, get to see some old friends and some uh, new ones. Uh, we are big, admir big admirers of uh, uh, public schools first. I was telling Yvonne that uh, that's a rough assignment in North Carolina to be concerned about public schools first, we tend to make that the toughest duty. Uh, but uh, uh, there is no issue more important. And I, don't, I know I don't have to work to uh, convince anyone of that. I also want to echo something that uh, Yvonne said about the cold coming. Um, we got a lot of teachers in this uh, organization. Um, uh, Heather and I have talked to a lot of teachers who describe uh, the horror of school kids starting to get scared and maybe antsy and maybe uh, crying when snow comes, thinking that uh, it's going to extend the number of days when they're not sure when they're going to be able to get something to eat. That in the wealthiest country on earth, the wealthiest country in human history, uh, it shames us. I'm, uh, as Yvonne said, I'm going to talk about uh, child poverty and hunger sort of generally. Uh, then I'll turn it over to Heather Hunt, who is, uh, as you'll see quickly, much smarter and more articulate than I am, and uh, uh, will concentrate on a sort of subset of this or on maybe an amplification of it, the challenges of poverty and hunger uh, as affected by. Uh, the pandemic that we seemed to have such a difficult time escaping from. And then we'll, uh, we're glad to have uh, lots of discussion. And we're honored that uh, y'all would invite us to share this work. Uh, let me start with uh, two or three quotes. Uh, one you'll be familiar with from Judge David Lee, the presiding judge in the Leandro case who wrote that, quote, this case is about children who are from high poverty, low performing districts and areas of the state that aren't being given 
a fair opportunity to get a sound basic education. Unfortunately, from the numbers I have seen, Judge Lee wrote, the sheer number of those at-risk students has increased dramatically and continues to do so over these three decades. In that sense, it is for North Carolina, a runaway train. Second from Tina Postal, uh, a friend of ours uh, who runs Loaves and Fishes in Charlotte, uh, a great soul of North Carolina. We need most of all compassionate policy making, Tina explains. Policies making a livable wage and affordable housing a reality. If you did those two things, it would put loaves and fishes out of business and we'd be more than happy to go out of business. I would love to be forced into another line of work. I dare you to put us out of business. Many of our policy makers' lives don't include the experience of low wage people, or if they did, they're too far away from it now. So they don't deliver compassionate policy making, something that we have to have. Tiffany Gladney at NC Child stressed to Heather and I that North Carolina's children are suffering. Our poverty rate is staggering. We have huge percentages of kids growing up in households below the poverty line. It's incumbent on us to ensure that we're investing in our children and in our families. It's incumbent on us to ensure that every baby has the opportunity to thrive. And as our colleague, Alexander Sirota of the Budget and Tax Center explained to us, I didn't sign up for a society that lets its children starve. I don't think any of us did. North Carolina countenances stunning levels of child poverty. One in five of our kids are poor. That's from the federal standard, an income of about $25,000 a year for a family of four. Let that sink in. If your family of four pulls in $26,000 a year, you're not in poverty. You're on easy street. You're also not even close to being able to feed and clothe and support your children. We have the 10th highest state child poverty rate in the country. The youngest of our kids are the poorest. 22% of our kids, five and under, live in poverty. One in 10 of North Carolina children lives in extreme poverty at incomes of half the federal poverty level. So about $12,500 a year for a family of four. One in 10 North Carolina children. Child poverty in North Carolina is both very highly racialized and gendered. Kids of color, as we were just shown, are poor at three times the rate of white kids, about 35%. And the Census Bureau reports that female householder families are very disproportionately impoverished. Childhood poverty in the past two decades has also become, as those slides show, decidedly more heavily concentrated. Four times as many kids now compared to the year 2000 live in high poverty neighborhoods. That multiplies their challenges since not only their economic barriers, but those of their neighbors can work to plague them. And as concentrated poverty rises, all the research shows that those concentrations crush economic mobility. So kid, kids who are born kids, kids who are born poor are more apt to stay that way. As Charlotte and Goldsboro, for example, could powerfully teach us, Tar Heel child poverty, as you also know, is geographically skewed. Some Eastern North Carolina counties have remarkably high levels of poor kids, some approaching 50%, if you can imagine. And even as we have ups and downs economically across Carolina over the decades, 
we have gotten used to extraordinarily high levels of child poverty. It seems now unremarkable to us, unworthy of our attentions. It's apparently not worrisome like these crucial matters like critical race theory in the public schools or transgender folks in our bathrooms or on our sports teams. We're used to crushing child poverty. We get used to things a society should never get used to. Child hunger or food insecurity, food hardship, call it what you want. The notion that kids can't get enough to eat it mirrors child poverty in North Carolina. Here too, one in five of our kids are food insecure, according to the federal government, some 500,000 of Tar Heel children, the 11th highest rate in the United States. 78 of our 100 counties have child hunger rates of over 20%. And in most North Carolina counties, more than half, more than one in four kids are hungry. Again, hunger among our kids is racialized and gendered. Female headed households see much higher levels of hunger. 62% of white households are food secure, though only 43% of black and Latinx families are. 250,000 North Carolina households are SNAP recipients, food stamp recipients, 21%. Six out of 10 North Carolina public school kids now qualify for free and reduced lunch programs. Here too, we've become accustomed to high levels of childhood hunger. Several of our cities have been identified by federal studies as among the worst in the country. This too fails to trigger cries of outrage or exigency. It's not thought to be worrisome or traumatic to have among the highest levels of childhood hunger in the country. No legislative programs are launched to combat it. More frequently, food stamp benefits are cut off by the General Assembly, especially for poor kids though it saves the state government not a penny because the dollars come from the feds. And if we're one of the worst states for child poverty in the United States, though we possess, as we all know, real economic prowess, how does the United States compare with other advanced democracies? The United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights found a couple of years ago that, quote, the United States is the richest, the poorest, and the most unequal nation in the world. His report concluded that, quote, a shockingly high number of children live in poverty in the United States. It is the, quote, extreme outlier for child poverty. Nearly twice as many American kids are poor as the average for Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Nations. We rank almost at the bottom of the 38 major free market democracies. Behind almost all the European and British Commonwealth countries, of course, but more shocking in child poverty, we also trail Latvia, South Korea, Lithuania, Estonia, Greece, the Slovak Republic and Mexico, you'd think we would be humiliated. Finally, for comparison purposes, we can look at how we compare in North Carolina with ourselves over time. In 1969, one in four of our kids, 25% were poor. A decade later, 1979, we'd improved significantly to 20%. By 1989, it had dropped to a little over 15%, but by 2012, we had essentially returned to the mid 20s, and now we were about 20% again. Eastern counties had made significant progress 25 years ago, but they've now reached their soaring levels again. 
international comparisons, our comparisons with other states, and our own comparisons over time with North Carolina itself, these are reminders that child poverty levels for us are tied to policy choices. They don't just issue from the hand of God. And as I think we've all come to know, especially the people on this call, the impact of poverty and hunger on our children from their very earliest years is intense and destructive. As Tiffany Gladney, the policy director at NC Child has explained, poverty is the biggest risk factor in a child's healthy development and growth. Poverty, their mental health and their physical health. North Carolina, it is tragic to say, is tough on its children. Though the state enjoys significant economic prowess and income and wealth, Stunningly high levels of our children live in wrenching poverty. And that poverty is joined, unsurprisingly, by soaring rates of food hardship. Put together, these twins leave hundreds of thousands of our kids without meaningful opportunities. And they diminish their natural rights to thrive, to compete, to develop, and to succeed. The economic and social burdens pressed upon poor children in North Carolina, one would think ought to be deemed unacceptable to a state that so readily proclaims its commitment to equality and so regularly, regularly declares how earnestly it values its families. An admirable society, I would think, lifts and values its children beyond any other interest or challenge. As the last two years have dramatically shown, like the decades preceding them, we have been insufficiently well prepared to feed, to nurture, to protect, to care for and educate our children. Few things could speak more poorly, more poorly of our stewardship. If we believe that we are incapable of addressing the profound evils of childhood poverty and hunger, then we have lost the ambition and the confidence that marked our forebears. If we believe we could address them, but we choose not to, then our moral failure is complete. I'll stop there and turn it over to my great colleague, Heather Hunt. Heather. I hate following Jean. It's such <laughs> it's such a tough act to follow. Jeez. All right. So um, Jean has provided this, this beautiful sweeping overview of poverty and food insecurity among North Carolina's families. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, I'm going to change course a little bit by focusing on a very specific situation, um, one that is still very much with us, um, and that's the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and I do this as sort of a case study to see how families with children have fared and to see what we can learn from it. And of course, at this very moment, the cat walks in. Hold on one second, everybody. Go. I am so sorry. All right, so many families, just to set the stage here, many families um, were already on shaky ground before the pandemic hit. Um, the child poverty rate and the growing share of K through 12 students um, who participate in free and reduced lunch, um, all the statistics that Jean just mentioned are actually measures of poor families, right? So. Children don't exist in isolation. If a child is poor, that means that their family is poor. Um, so there are numerous reasons why um, the state has this widespread financial insecurity among many of its families. Uh, it's way too complicated to get into here, but I would um, put forth one one reason that I think is one of the stronger, bigger reasons is that the nature of work has changed dramatically over the past 
two decades or so. Um, that is the number of good jobs um, that are available to someone without a college degree have shrunk, right? And by good job, I mean one that um, pays a living wage and that offers decent benefits. Um, in the place of these lost good jobs that were available to say someone with a high school diploma, we've got a growing number of jobs on the high end. So good paying jobs that require a college degree or more and on the low end. So precarious jobs that pay a relatively low wage. Um, I did a calculation um, on how, what, how many uh, workers there are in North Carolina that are low wage workers. Um, and for people who are um, between the ages of 25 and 64, so these are prime age working age workers who work for an employer, they're not self-employed, um, over four in 10, so about 44% of workers in North Carolina earn $15 an hour or less. Um, that was my definition of low wage. So um, you combine this, these low wages with rising costs, uh, and that means that households are ever more stretched. Um, in addition, uh, support for families when it exists is piecemeal and, and meager. Um, so you've got the situation where there are a lot of, um, sort of financially fragile families. So when COVID struck, it was a crisis that had many facets. Um, there were health facet, economic, education. Um, and what we found when we looked at the data um, starting from spring of 2020 onward is that families with children were especially finan financially and emotionally distressed um, during the pandemic and continuing. Um, so for example, and I apologize for people who don't like numbers because uh, this is going to be a parade of numbers for a little while. <laughs> it's just, I think, the statistics, I mean, they're, they're sort of numbing, um, but I think it's also one of the better ways to describe how pervasive um, some of these, these um, impacts are. So um, families with children were more likely to experience employment related income loss than households with no children. Um, so that means that they either, um, you know, they had hours cut at work or they lost jobs. Um, on average, about half of adults with children in the home reported that their household income, they, they lost household income between spring of 2020 and spring of 2021. So half of adults with children in the home lost income. Um, families with children were twice as likely as those with no children to have a very difficult time paying for essential household items. Um, as recently as this past October, uh, four out of 10 adults with a child in the home reported that they had cut back on or went without basic goods like food or medicine so they could pay an energy bill. One in four renters with children in the home reported that they had fallen behind on rent. And of course, this is particularly worrisome um, because at the end of the summer, the Supreme Court uh, basically ended the eviction, the federal eviction moratorium. So all of these renters who have fallen behind on rent are now at risk of being evicted, which is uh, an incredibly traumatic event. Um, turning to food insecurity, we've seen incredibly high levels of food insecurity among um, families with children. Um, Adults uh, in households with children consistently week after week reported higher levels of food insecurity throughout 2020 and 2021. Um, again, as recently as this past October, just a few months ago, 39%, basically four out of 10 adults in households with kids reported that they could not afford adequate types or quantities of food in the past seven days. So four out of 10 adults who are living with kids couldn't afford food. Um, this was about eight percentage points more than households with no children. So higher levels of food insecurity. Um, this particular statistic I find um, very heart-wrenching. Um, so of households with kids that are food insecure, so you've got all the households with children, but then that the food insecure households with children, over a third of adults in those households reported that the children 
in the household did not have enough to eat in the past seven days? That was exactly the question that was asked. Did your child have enough to eat in the past seven days? Over a third on average said no. This is hundreds of thousands of households week after week saying that the children weren't eating enough. Now the Census Bureau where I'm getting this, this data doesn't ask how many children are in the household. So, you know, I don't know exactly the number of children that this represents, but at least one. <laughs> so hundreds of thousands of children um, in the state. Um, this distressing rate um, continued well into the fall. Uh, I lo last looked at it in October. Um, and the share had dropped slightly. Um, in October, 32% of adults in food insecure households with children said that the children had not eaten enough in the past seven days. So still about a third. Um, so the hardships that the pandemic has wrought uh, have also taken their toll on the mental well-being um, of families. Um, on average, about two thirds of adults with kids in the home reported feeling nervous, anxious, or on edge at least several days out of the previous uh, week when the survey was, was asked. About 57% reported not being able to stop or control worrying um, in the past, at least several days out of the past week. And over half reported feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Um, so this, <sighs> Parents, you know, can be incredibly, you know, resourceful and strong and amazing, but this uh, kind of constant undercurrent of chronic stress, of depression, um, it makes it even more difficult to run a household, to provide for a family, and to be there for their kids. So I think mental health is a huge issue um, that isn't addressed enough um, and is deeply tied to, to poverty and economic disadvantage. Um, and of course, as Jean mentioned, and as that chart um, at the beginning of the presentation noted um, that black and brown families were hit even harder. Um, so black and Hispanic households were more likely to experience income loss, um, had a more difficult time paying for the usual household expenses and far more were food insecure. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to leave um, this with a question that I'm partially going to answer, but we could discuss more. Um, one of the things that, that, you know, this has made me wonder doing this research is how exceptional a moment was the pandemic. Um, my perspective um, sort of goes along these lines is that, you know, the pandemic was, you know, sort of unusual in the sense that it happened to everyone all at once um, across the nation. Um, that's why we have this data because it was considered important enough to track and measure. Um, but in some ways, the pandemic for a, a lot of families is no different than any, uh, any other kind of, um, you know, sort of unexpected tragic event that could knock someone off track, right? It could be a medical emergency or, a divorce or a, you know, a debt or home repair or you know, anything that comes along that sort of pushes families off the edge. Um, so all the economic challenges that were faced by North Carolinian families during the pandemic are the same ones that they faced before and will continue to face after until and unless something changes. That's the policy work that, that Jean mentioned. Um, so for me, this is a, a pretty bleak indictment about who we are um, as a state, as a society, and then what our priorities are, um, you know, because if you look at the, the facts on the ground, it doesn't look like it's families and kids, especially poor families and kids. Um, so that I will, I will stop there and thank you very much. So one of the things that I told Heather and Jean I wanted to do tonight um, is first just lift up and, and share this remarkable research. And we, we uh, have put the link in the chat. We'll do it again uh, several times before the end because um, reading this report is incredibly important as well as it's important that you share this information. 
And we're going to talk about that later. But right now, I asked Jean and Heather if they'd be willing to just consider this a conversation. So I really want to invite you into that conversation now. I want you to be able to share your thoughts and questions. Um, and if you would raise your hand, we'll, we'll, we'll try to make sure that that we have a chance to let you, you can, you can share a thought or you can ask a question, you know, kind of keep it brief so we can have a lot of conversation. Um, many of us participate, but if you raise your hand or uh, Elizabeth, I don't know if people are unmuted or what we're doing here, but anyone like to share some thoughts or ask some questions? There, there are also several questions in the chat box as well, Yvonne. Okay, well, well Terrence, will you throw some of those out? Not a problem. Uh, one, uh, one of the earlier questions um, uh, states, are there policy gaps? Are the policy gaps more of a function of the NCYTE legislature failure to act or the lack of pro, you know, proactive efforts by the executive branch? Unmute. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm usually more articulate when I'm muted. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm willing to take a little bit of a shot at that. Uh, uh, we have a lot of challenges and shortcomings in North Carolina when it comes to how we treat our kids. But you you also can't realistically talk about hunger and poverty in North Carolina and omit the fact that in the last 10 years, uh, our legislature has waged one of the stoutest wars on poor people seen in any state government in half a century. Um, uh, that's, that's harsh to say, it's um, tragic, um, you know, it can, rub people uh, the wrong way, but you could run through the list of decisions made in our state house, which target low income people. I think if you, it's, it's not impossible to say a, a, a sad look at North Carolina's history concerning poor people is at least in the last uh, 30 years, uh, Democrats have largely ignored poor people, uh, but in the last 10 years, they've learned that there's something worse than that, which is you can be targeted, poor people can be targeted uh, by the legislature. You know the list, we, uh, you know, we want to just, uh, what, 11 or 12 states now that has refused to expand Medicaid, uh, though it means uh, that probably 600,000 of us uh, don't have health care coverage that we would. And Harvard tells us over a thousand Tar Heels a year die as a result of that decision. Uh, it's probably true in at least some of the studies that uh, uh, it would effectively cost us nothing to expand uh, Medicaid. But we choose to do it out of uh, principle. <laughs> I, I I struggle to think of what that principle is. Uh, I, it began as the principle of not doing anything to support anything that was uh, put forward by Barack Obama. Uh, I don't know what it is now. We wanna be the standard bearer for cruelty so we can brag about that among our other state legislators. We. Uh, created uh, in the last decade, this, the largest cut to an unemployment uh, compensation program in American history, uh, taking us to last. Um, and just to think about it, um, think of those two things in connection with what Heather just talked about. We've had these real dramatic and massive challenges from COVID. Um, and the North Carolina legislature obviously didn't cause COVID, but those two policy decisions they made, crushing unemployment compensation and uh, refusing to expand uh, Medicaid, uh, left us dramatically diminished in our ability to respond to COVID. Uh, 
uh, unemployment and loss of uh, work uh, and loss of health care uh, soared dramatically. The cost for our hospitals to care for folks uh, uh, soars dramatically. And think about that. Our, our legislature went back in session during COVID uh, a year ago, year and a half ago, knowing they'd made those cuts and refused to reconsider them, even as Yvonne said, when there's money to do it, uh, out of uh, some distorted notion that it's, uh, it's remarkable and delightful to be cruel um, uh, to those at the bottom. Uh, they did that knowing, I, I don't know how, it, I mean, you know, they gave us this, uh, uh, these dramatic unemployment compensation cuts because they assume that uh, North Carolinians are lazy and that they don't want to work. Um, uh, did they assume that North Carolinians all of a sudden didn't want to work when COVID hit? Uh, we just decided to uh, gather around the couch and uh, enjoy ourselves. Um, still, they refused to change the, uh, the sort of dramatic um, uh, cuts to unemployment compensation. So I could give you a long list. It's much longer than those two that I started with. But uh, the fact is, we've seen a war against low income people that has not been replicated anywhere else. And uh, uh, we started in a bad spot when it comes to uh, people in the bottom third. Uh, and that bad spot has gotten notably worse. And then before I, I asked a couple more questions, I wanted to know if you wanted to add anything there. Yeah, so I just wanted to, to give another example, which is, yeah, I don't know, maybe one of my favorite sort of pointless cruelty examples, which is not only has North Carolina failed to um, raise the minimum wage above the, the federal baseline, so it's 725, which is as low as you could go, um, but it has forbidden local governments from raising the minimum wage within their own jurisdiction. So not only you know, has it decided, no, we're not gonna do that statewide, but we're gonna tell you, Charlotte or Asheville, that you can't either, um, even if that's what your voters support. Um, so it's just, um, uh, yeah, breathtaking in its sort of micro control cruelty. Well, especially when you think about um, how how much uh, a lot of uh, legislators tout local control and how important it is and how much they support it. And they think, you know, and, and so this flies in the face of that. I, I want to shift slightly back because we've gotten a whole bunch of questions about Leandro. How does Leandro give us a little bit more linking in how Leandro um, fits into this and what's going on, especially I think, Jean, when you read that quote from Judge Lee, it was, it, you know, I think he was really targeting in his comments those high poverty kids, schools. So let's talk about those high poverty schools and, and how Leandro really makes a difference there. Yeah, well, um, you know, Yvonne, everybody on this call knows um, the impact of poverty on the chance for kids to get a good education, to get an equal education. Um, we know a lot about K-12 education in the United States. It's been studied a lot. Um, there's a fellow out in California named Sean Reardon who has done remarkable work about the economic gap in uh, K-12 education in the United States. The, uh, achievement gap between low wealth kids, the poorest kids, and those with higher incomes. Uh, it is stunning. Uh, and I've always, uh, I heard Sean Reardon say one time that not only do we know this, do we know the dramatic impact of income inequality and poverty on uh, American education, we know it more than we know anything else about education we know the dramatic impact, negative impact that it has on poor kids. Oddly, in North Carolina, 
as you all know, through Leandro for 30 years, we've had a mandate under the constitution and under judicial decree to do something about it. But that mandate has not been followed up with action. Um, to be candid, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, crankiness towards Leandro uh, by uh, both political parties, but it is uh, nothing like that which exists right now. Um, Judge Lee, Judge Manning, um, their patience eventually has uh, worn thin, worn out. Uh, and so they are pressing the notion of judicial enforcement. Uh, I read in the paper every day or two of uh, Phil Berger and Tim Moore uh, ranting and raving about the, uh, uh, the judicial usurpation uh, in Judge Lee's decrees. Um, saying in effect that the legislature has the sole power concerning uh, appropriations uh, and that uh, Judge Lee has stepped out, out of his lane uh, and that the treatment of the, legis of the uh, public schools is simply up to the legislative grace uh, of uh, the General Assembly. Uh, that's not what our constitution says. The lane of our lawmakers does not include the ability to grotesquely and repeatedly and dramatically deny the constitutional rights of low-income school kids. Uh, but they apparently think it is. They think that's their lane. They think that's their uh, prerogative. Uh, I'm a constitutional lawyer. Uh, uh, I am hopeful, uh, though, uh, one would be silly, I think, to be optimistic on this front, but there is no doubt that courts have the power to order legislators to comply with the Constitution. It gets rough, it gets uh, uh, testy, uh, because uh, the push and shove of separation of powers uh, uh, is complicated in the United States, but our Constitution demands that these kids be given an adequate education, sound public education. It doesn't give discretion to the legislature to violate that, nor do legislators have the inherent right to deny the constitutional rights of school kids. So uh, uh, I think Judge Lee's got the better part of the argument. Now, I, I make no predictions about how that will turn out, but. But are we proud, these legislators? Are they uh, uh, happy of their record? This record of uh, radically diminished funding, this 30 years of fact finding that we're uh, not giving at-risk kids uh, uh, constitutionally mandated uh, uh, education. Would that be a, a record that you wanna brag about when you go home? I've stood out for 30 years to stop these kids from getting the constitutional uh, mandated education that they deserve. That's what I want put on my tombstone, by God. Well, uh, I think uh, the courts have the right to enforce these decrees, uh, and I hope that they will. Now, that doesn't mean it, it's going to work easy. It doesn't mean they'll do it. I'm not even necessarily confident that the North Carolina Supreme Court uh, will do it. But uh, despite everything you read in the paper, the North Carolina legislature is given no discretion to deny the constitutional rights of North Carolina school kids. It's outside their lane. It's outside their job description. Uh, and frankly, the notion, given their track record of radical constitutional transgression, the notion that Phil Berger and Tim Moore would lecture anybody about complying with the Constitution uh, is, it's breathtaking in its own right. But I don't, I don't want to go on because I'm, I'm worried that I might say something that's intemperate. And so uh, uh, let me just stop there. Well, and I would just add quickly to, to all of this, and not this audience understands, as Jane has pointed out, but we know from five decades of research 
that having a high quality teacher in every classroom, having supplies and resources in every classroom, having children coming to school prepared for kindergarten, not hungry, having aftercare, um, child care. We know what all these things Im impact. We have thousands of research articles by many, many of our uh, colleagues at our 16 universities, right, in the public system. And we know these are, these are hard facts and we track children over decades to show the impact of a high quality education. And we know that we're having a disparity between these high poverty schools that they are having even struggling more. Even in our wealthy counties, there's tremendous struggle. Um, last week, uh, the superintendent of public instruction put out a report of her year and one of the things she said in there is that 60% of the children last year in public schools qualified for a free or reduced lunch. That 60%, that's, that's the, the school systems calculating, right? The kids who are actually going in to the cafeteria. So that's a stunning figure uh, to think about across the state of North Carolina. Um, I, I want to... Uh, Swift back to you, uh, Terrence. What what are else are we missing in here uh, that we need to ask? Not a problem. Um, so there uh, was several questions that centered um, the role of parents, and also what can we do beyond lobbying? Uh, Heather, you. I mean, I. I'm not trying to hog it, but uh, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot either, so. I'm, I'm curious, um, so what can, the role of parents in what sense, Terrence, was there a more specific? Yeah, yeah so uh, there, was, there was several questions. One said in the research, what's the impact on parents? And then also, how do we speak to parents since they have a, uh, an ability to vote? So they, the, the, question then followed up and said, because students aren't voters, are legislators ignoring their issues? Um, I'll take I'm going to think about that one. Okay, you want to go? Okay. Um, the, you know, the question of parental responsibility or participation in this process is a dramatic one, a complicated one. The question of the uh, um, ability of some parents to uh, provide food for their kids is a tough and challenging one. Um, and also the question of uh, political participation in North Carolina, which you highlight, Terrence, or the questions do, is a crucial one. I, I, I think that uh, my sense of it is this, if we focus on political uh, participation for a minute. I'm out and about in North Carolina a lot, have been for 20 years. Uh, I'm pretty convinced of this. North Carolinians actually believe in the value of high quality public education. They, they're committed to it. They, they think it's in our uh, blood. They think that we've made progress as a state uh, over the last 50 years, digging out from the uh, place we were around World War II, the last uh, 50 years, 70 years, uh, largely because of education. Um, that's true in big cities, it's true in small towns. And I think that if you put it to North Carolinians, are you satisfied, are you happy are you content with lawmakers who are out to destroy the public schools? They would say, no, they'd be horrified by it. Um, but it's also true as all of you know, through your activism in this organization. Uh, most parents, I guess, are not paying attention to this. They're not active on this question. Uh, my experience, they, people don't readily want to believe that we have this emergency that we face, which requires the saving of our public schools. People don't want to believe that their lawmakers are out to destroy the public schools when 
the, the case could not be clearer that that's exactly true. This scheme of crushing public education and then providing every measure of largesse to vouchers uh, and the like is designed to uh, punish public schools and to provide an off ramp for folks into private education. That's the goal, that's the agenda of North Carolina, of the North Carolina legislature. Uh, that couldn't be clearer. It couldn't be clearer that uh, the North Carolina legislature wants to dismantle and crush public schools. Uh, now, I don't think, I think most North Carolinians would think that's a shit idea. Uh, that's contrary to what they believe in. But you, you know what it's like. Uh, you know, people got, they, they work long hours. They got to try and figure out how to get daycare for their kids, how to get their kids to school. Uh, they're driving their kids around to various things. Nobody's got the time to be working the political process, or at least lots of us don't. And uh, I think most people don't want to believe that we're in some sort of state of tremendous urgency or that the people who run the state would actually kill public education. We have to get that point across more powerfully. Now, I know y'all do that. My hat is off to you. But see, I think this is what's gonna happen. This is what I'm trying to say. 10 years, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, we're gonna have if we don't change this, uh, dramatic destruction of our public schools. And I think th these same parents who are busy taking their kids places and not getting involved in the political process, not exercising their uh, demands and obligations of political uh, engagement, they're gonna wake up and say, who in the hell destroyed the public schools in North Carolina? And people like Yvonne and you guys are going to say, we've been telling you for 15 years exactly who is destroying the public schools in North Carolina, but you didn't pay attention. We understand you had other stuff on your mind, uh, but that's the dilemma that we face. And I think in a way it's most pointed with public education, because I work a lot on poverty policies and other matters. Um, I think with public education, what our leaders do dramatically violates what our co-citizens want more powerfully than in any other area. And that's why, I mean, I'm going on here too long. It's why every time that it gets to be election cycle, uh, they come up with some uh, uh, largely faked uh, raise for uh, teachers, uh, under which they go out and claim, oh, we're all for public education. That's all, we're public education all day long, every day. Then they get reelected and they start back their work for the next three and a half years or two and a half, whatever the term would be, literally systematically destroying public education. That's what we have here. It's a tragedy. And I don't know, one of the lucky things in my life was, uh, getting to be close friends with uh, Bill Friday, who I miss still. And Bill would say, you know, the story of my life is that it can take 60, 70 years to build an institution, and then you can destroy them uh, in a moment's breath, in a hot minute. Uh, hot minute. And that's, uh, that's what's happening in North Carolina right now. One of the comments that are um, seeing in the chat too is someone asked a provocative question, I think is where's the media and what's the media's role or responsibility in this? And, and actually um, I, I plan, I sent um, Jean's and Heather's report to seven or eight of my favorite reporters this week and said, these people should be your guests. Mm -hmm. You should do specials uh, talking to these folks. You need to, we need the media's help in sharing the, uh, the plight of our public schools and sharing the plight of our poor children, our hungry children, and we need to do it. So I encourage all of you, if you have a connection to a media outsource, uh, to a friend who works at uh, a TV station or a radio station, I encourage you to share this report. 
share the link and encourage them to do a special story um, on this this report and and to quote some of this information. And I I think that um, Gene is remarkably spot on when we talk about it's hard to imagine. And Heather, you you look at economic development issues. It's hard to imagine that we're willing to overlook the human potential that we're willing to that if we wanted to look at it in a very uh, cynical way, you know. We need children to be educated. We need adults to move into the labor force. We need people to run our country and to run our hospitals and our EMS and our libraries and our stores, right? We, we need the human potential developed to allow all of us a fuller and richer situation. So Heather, maybe you can, um, in your research around that whole issue, isn't it startling to you that we're willing to not look at the, the cost the, the cost long-term of denying children their potential. So I think there's no price for a politician to pay when you're looking at future cost, right? I mean, that's the cynical response and I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but they're looking at the next, like as Jean said, you know, two to three to four years, when's the next re-election? Um, they don't care necessarily um, from a, a political point of view what happens in 15 years. Now, is that short-sighted and does it undermine the state's economy and does it put all these, these successes that the state actually has accomplished um, at risk? Absolutely. Does it um, squander all that human potential that you just mentioned? Absolutely. I mean, just think of all the, you know, the inventions or the entrepreneurs or, you know, all the, the, the stuff, all the economic growth that, that we're abandoning, um, just leaving it by the wayside um, because, you know, we want to spite poor people or something. Um, the reasons are a little, a little murky in my mind. Um, but, you know, to address that media question, it occurred to me that this is the media question suffers in some ways. Why hasn't the media paid more attention to this? The answer to that in some ways is the answer to that previous discussion as well, um, because the media is under attack. Right? So we have fewer local papers. We don't have local journalism to report on these issues. We rely on you know, two state newspapers, basically, who are owned by a giant corporate you know, newspaper company um, that have gotten slimmer and slimmer over the years. And you know, we do have some good radio. We have some, you know, some TV and some local publications. Um, but that's another place where you know the, the 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 substance of the institution is being undermined. So I think yeah, I would love for the the media to pay more attention to this, but I don't know how much of the media is left. <laughs> Sadly, I mean, so they're under duress as well. So Heather, you make a good point. <laughs> it's also maybe a segue into a another question way back, but someone said, "What what can we do? You know, what are the uh, next steps or the actions that we can do. So, so what Public Schools First feels very dedicated to is to educating and the public. We want to educate, inform, engage the public and making sure that we're beating the pots and pans loudly about what's going on in our public schools and how we can save them. But we, but we need everybody to do this. And, and then a subset of that is now, you know, or what is happening to our children? What is happening to our children out of school and how it does it impact them in school? We know that kids who come to school hungry don't perform as well if they're not, they're not sleeping at night, if there's turmoil, turmoil in the house, if there's lack of, lack of jobs, if there's lack of income in the homes. Um, one of the things that Terrence and I do is we show the film Resilience about adverse childhood experiences on children. And we encourage you to engage us in that conversation sometime. Because one of the things that we learn very quickly in those adverse childhood ex experiences is that they add up. And if you have domestic violence in the home or alcohol or drug addiction in the home or unemployment in the home, um, if you're homeless, these things add up and pile up on children and impact their short and long-term um, opportunities. In fact, impact their longevity. They live 
not as long, right? The higher ACEs you have. Um, and one of the things that I know from, uh, I grew up in a home with domestic violence and alcoholism, but I wasn't homeless. And there was food and there was income coming from jobs, right? And so you add homelessness, food, food stress that Heather talked about, food insecurity, and all these things add on, and there's no way for families out. And we see what happens to children physically and mentally, and our high levels of, of child and abuse neglect rates and in teen suicide. In fact, now it's not teen suicide, it's 10 to 14, 10 to 18 year olds. Um, and the suicide rates have been doubled. So we have a lot of impact here, folks. And so what can we do, right? So one of the things that I'll just say is that we want to educate voters so that then when they go vote, we want them to be education voters. We want them to look at the candidates and decide if this person is a pro-education, pro-children um, person or not. So what are some other things that y'all would like to share about, that you think we can do? Um, Gene started us off in the very intro of his report. And he said, we have got to work really hard on talking to our legislators and letting them know how we feel. I don't care what party they are. We have the obligation to bring to their attention um, what's going on and to, and to reach the lawmakers. We, have, we can't give up on that, y'all. And then he said, we need to ask for compassionate policies. And Gene, I love that so much that next time I go, and call a legislator, I'm going to start using that sentence. I'm calling you today to ask you to look at this with a compassionate heart and to help uh, this state move um, to a place that that might be our new logo, North Carolina, where compassion is abundant. Wouldn't that be incredible? But who else has some things that they can share that they can just, just Don't tell them it came from me or they might throw you out of your office. So. I'll say Heather saw me. Okay. All right, thank <laughs> you. I'll blame it I think you could say uh, Tina. Uh, yeah. That would be better. So is it? A, and we've mentioned tonight the media. Uh, that's also um, a, a good a good source. But I don't think that we can give up. Um, you know, we have to keep educating ourselves, our public, our friends. I'm going to tell you something. At my church, poor kids aren't there. So yeah. my church can be. You know, it's a great place. I love my church. There's a lot of great people there, but poor kids aren't there. They don't see poor kids and it's particularly very poor kids. And I live in a middle income community, middle to low income community, but we aren't seeing this, right? So I think the idea that, that um, Jean put out there is that, you know, yeah, our public doesn't know what we're facing. Our, the public is trying to survive too. If, if, I, if, if I can add this, uh, in part because I'm looking at the faces on this screen, and I know a lot of them. I know how engaged you are, how remarkable you are, how unrepresentative you are, to be candid, uh, when it comes to the state of North Carolina. So I know that this is talking to the choir, and a lot of you are real fine tenor singers or whatever, however you'd want to characterize it. I think maybe a couple things. Um, I, I think even among us, among uh, uh, the folks who are actively engaged in this, we don't as clearly and readily and uh, consistently point out the systematic nature of these deprivations. We don't as clearly link them to policy choices that we are making. Um, we, we don't as clearly link them to their, our own decisions, choices that uh, our leaders make. Here's one thing I find. Um, I, I go around and tell the facts of child poverty in North Carolina as much as I can. Uh, those facts include we're one of the very worst states in the United States, which is the worst country among the 40 major developed nations. That's not the way North Carolinians think of themselves. It's not the way Americans think of themselves. Um, I rarely meet anybody who knows or even is anxious to quickly believe that we're the richest country on the face of the earth 
But we have the highest levels of poverty and far and away the highest levels of child poverty. And when, when people learn that, they go, Jesus, that's, that can't be, but it is. Uh, I think too, uh, it's related to policies and choices that we have allowed to be made in our name. And we don't talk about that enough. Uh, we don't talk about the fact that these are decisions which are being made day in and day out, which have this effect on our kids. Two more things and I'll stop, I promise. Uh, Al, uh, Alexander Sirota, I was much stuck in, uh, struck in long conversations with her and she said something which uh, uh, jolted me a little bit. She said, imagine how different our lives would be, the lives of our kids would be, if we took as our first principle, the highest value of government, what do we need to do to make sure that our kids can thrive? Now, of the many policy choices that a people could make, it seems to me that's quite a logical one. What we think is our highest priority. We want to do what it takes to give all our kids a chance to thrive. We don't do that at all. We don't look at policy choices that way. We think about uh, making sure that wealthy people get uh, even more than they have. Uh, but one of the things Alexander was pointing out too, I think of what COVID showed. It, on the one hand, you've got to say, there are unbelievable volunteer efforts, charitable efforts, uh, some of them religious based, uh, all over the state of North Carolina who came to the, uh, uh, rose to the challenge in stunning ways during COVID. And COVID of course uh, continues. But you know, it became pretty clear early on that this advanced society might not be able to keep its kids from starving. Schools got closed, people couldn't go uh, uh, get, uh, kids couldn't get food. Uh, there were great volunteer efforts, but and we spent a lot of time in uh, food banks and the like. Those are, uh, uh, those are volunteer efforts. The volunteers were scared to go uh, to food banks because they thought they might get COVID, could you imagine a country of our prowess perhaps not being able to feed its kids? Talk about a declaration that you've gone wrong. So I think we've got to talk about these choices we made. I also hope you'll do this. You're great advocates for schools, but one of the reasons we have so much problem in our schools is we allow so much poverty, so much more poverty than other nations. Uh, Sean Reardon's work would show that uh, our schools would not be ranked uh, so low in international comparisons, except we countenance twice as many poor kids as any other advanced nation would. And you can't have the highest levels of child poverty and the best schools. It is literally impossible to do that. Our folks think that you can our folks think, well, we do every kind of reform to education that can be known to man, except dealing with poverty. That we won't do. In fact, we're only going to encourage it. So all these choices that we make about minimum wage, about uh, ending the earned income tax credit, God almighty, can you imagine a place doing that? Uh, choices we could make about child tax credit, about affordable uh uh, child care, affordable housing, uh, health care, of course. These are all choices we make which crush the bottom third, and it shows up as a society. And I don't think we're doing ourselves any good by not talking about it. Um, somebody um, asked, and I think it's, it's worth um, giving you and Heather or anyone that wants to to throw it in there, what kind of things would we do to make our kids thrive? What would those policy be? You know, affordable housing, livable wages, raising the minimum wage, expanding Medicaid, having universal pre-K, having you know, uh, having you know, having childcare. 
uh, that's affordable and sustainable, making sure that low-income families who work have the safety net for childcare and for food. Um, I think that's why you need to, to, to read this report because um, it's really uh, struck me um, how everything that we are talking about in terms of Leandro, we're talking about in terms of raising, closing the gaps, it's everything we're talking about in terms of lifting children up and giving their constitutional rights really rests on the, on the, on the shoulders of, of poverty and hunger and racism. In this, and you know, when we look at the people who are running the General Assembly, we wonder if they've lost contact with their rural roots uh, with the communities that they serve and with the issues around uh, with the, that are going on around our poor children. Um, anyone else have, um, it, it is 817. I would like if it's okay with everybody. Okay, Sean, you have your hand up. Um, go ahead, Sean. Sorry, hey, do you hear me okay? Do you, do you yes. hear me okay? Yes. Okay, man, what a great conversation. So I'm a grad student at NCSU. Uh, trying to become a middle school teacher and um, as a springboard to become a principal. And what I really, really struggle with in all aspects of life, I'm about to retire from the military in 18 months, is the empathy piece. And how I want this to really walk away from this is to help me understand where, you know, we're talking about the government and policy and legislation helping um, the students and to reduce poverty. And I feel like, you know, are, are food stamps at a shortage? And I don't, I don't know that they are. I, I don't know if, it, if it's tough, if it's complicated to get food stamps. And that we're talking about, you know, populations who have, you know, and this is going to show my bias. And that's why I want you to help me to have the empathy here is that, you know, I know that, that they have $500 car payments. I know that they have $300 Verizon payments. I know that they are, I mean, they are putting, we're so in debt. And of course that, that, that piles onto the children and that these families are eligible for free breakfast, free lunch and food stamps. How do we expect and should we expect the government to bail out families that have become victims of their choices? And I don't want to sound callous or unempathetic, but just trying to understand how like we have children who come to school hungry, but they have, you know, fake eyelashes, new braids, new car, newest iPhone. Like how, like how do we, we see past that and just look at the child? Cause that's not their fault. Can you, can you help me? And I hope I'm not the only one of these 73 participants who, who don't believe that, you know, is it necessarily all about legislation and policy to help feed children? Thank you. Sean, I commend you for, for you know, being brave enough in a sense to say something that might be you know, sort of unpopular in this crowd. Um, I think that's a really complicated issue. And I think this is my response is, hi, <laughs> sorry, you just got big on the screen. Um, <laughs> well, a lot, a lot of this, I was, um, I was, I was just listening in because I'm, I'm with the family, I'm eating dinner and I'm just learning so much. And I don't want to put something out there that's unpopular and not be willing to, to show my face. <laughs> well, very nice meeting you, seeing you. Um, I think the empathy piece comes from um, meeting people where they are. Um, and at least that's uh, something that that's happened to me a lot when we go around interviewing people. Um, you know, things that appear, you know, sort of that you can cast judgment on from one perspective may actually have a very good explanation from another. And I don't want to discount the, the desire of poor parents to um, make their kids feel good, right? We've heard often and uh, you know across the state over many years, um, and I'm you know I'm talking about the the nails and the iPhone and all that, um, the desperate, desperate, deep need that parents have to satisfy their kids' needs. And those needs are, are many, right? So it's, you know, basic needs. We're talking food, housing, that kind of thing. But it's also, you know, their desire to fit in, to not look poor, 
to you know not be made fun of um to have the latest gadget um sometimes you know a, a cell phone is really a computer for a lot of kids um you know so it's it's both you know sort of a status thing but it's also a very functional thing um so i think you know, there are certainly bad parents or, you know, parents that you could take issue with out there, but before um, making assumptions, if I was going to advise a principal, I would ask them to really get to know the parents of the students that they have, because I think that might, that might shift or, or affect um, one's attitude. I want to just throw out two more quick things because we're going to have to wrap this up. I want to just throw out that I had one question here that we have a lot of young people. Somebody says my son's 16, a lot of high school kids that want to know what they can do, how they can get involved in fighting poverty and hunger. And I think that's really cool. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that one. And um, I, I, and and also, if people are saying there's a lot of misconceptions about what uh, what we think of as government support out there. SNAP is not what people think it is, um, and it's not very generous on top of that. And neither are vouchers for daycare or for um, housing. Or what they get you is very little, and usually it's matching, which most folks can't do. So Heather or Jean, anything I've kind of thrown out there the last kind of couple of questions, what can young people do? How can we encourage them? What, how, what, are, what are the other ways we can dispel some of these myths about uh, the safety? Let, let me add just a little bit in response to that and to Sean's point. Because um, I've uh, spent uh, a great deal of the last 20 years interviewing low-income people uh, in North Carolina, and I don't find this uh, abuse uh, of the system, this uh, uh, living high on the hog. I found remarkable deprivation and stunning resilience. Uh, the ability of low-income people uh, to, uh, against all odds, fight to support their kids. I find among the most inspiring things I'd ever seen. And just, just for a tiny bit of perspective, uh, we are the wealthiest uh, nation on earth. We have the greatest inequality, the greatest poverty among kids. And Americans don't tend to understand it, but we, we have the stingiest social network, uh, social uh, services infrastructure uh, of any of the major advanced nations. So we tend to think there's a lot of uh, rumors or uh, here's a way to put it. Uh, you, there are national polls which look at Americans and legislators, ask them, why do we have more poor people than uh, uh, other major countries? And the bulk of our legislators and the bulk of Americans say, because we have such generous welfare programs. That's why. Now, the fact is of the major nations, we have the stingiest welfare programs. If being cruel to poor people reduced poverty, we would have the lowest levels of poverty among the advanced nations rather than the highest. So a lot of us, I mean, you know, you can meet a lot of different kinds of folk. I don't deny that. Uh, but uh, that's not reflective of the low income folks uh, that I see uh, in North Carolina. I'd add this too, I, this comes more from some friends of mine who do a lot of uh, poverty work and they will run, like uh, uh, Clyde Fitzgerald who died a couple of years ago, ran all the food banks in uh, uh, Northwestern uh, North Carolina. And uh, his friends would come to him and say, Clyde, don't you feel bad helping out these poor people who are just wanting to kind of live off the fat of the land. There's no real poverty or hunger in Winston-Salem and Greensboro, despite the statistics showing that they're among the most deprived in the country. And eventually Clyde started saying, you don't think there's any poverty in Winston-Salem and in Greensboro? Come on with me, get in the car. You got 20 minutes, I'll take you. And he says, same experience I've had, 
uh, uniformly, 100% of the time, they say, oh, no, I can't really, I don't really have time to do that right now. We have an inaccurate view of the challenges of poverty faced by our brothers and sisters. We are glad to have it. It makes us feel a little better about the way uh, our inequality unfolds. Uh, but you won't find that uh, from people who are working in low-income communities. And you won't find it if you go out talking to people actually facing the challenges of poverty in North Carolina. Uh, they are remarkably resilient, committed to their kids, uh, and I think strong beyond what I could do myself. And, and Yvonne, if you don't, if you don't mind, Yvonne, uh, I've actually been a teacher and a principal in uh, communities and neighborhoods of high concentrations of poverty, both rural and urban. Um, and there's one thing as a principal that allowed for me to understand the plight of my students. And that was a social worker who took me on a trip to home visits, sitting in people's living rooms, seeing and hearing from them directly in their community. Um, to, to Gene's point, you will not find too many principals that will take that trip. You will not find too many teachers that will take that trip. Uh, but what's significant about that trip is that you actually get to dismantle some of those notions of poverty. Um, and and I, did, I, don't, I really didn't see the same example in terms of what Gene was saying uh, of individuals who are living high um, uh, on the hog uh, off of support programs. Um, I actually seen people who were homeless living in their car when it was cold outside, um, wearing the same clothes, um, having to hide uh, things in their book bag to take home so they can eat. Uh, so I've actually seen the opposite of, of that story, but uh, I, I would encourage um, reducing the barriers between the professionals in the building and the community itself. Thank you, Terrence. Um, Heather, did you have anything you wanted to add? Are you, so I guess, you know, just it, try I to wrap it in up. conclusion too, Heather, do a kind of a concluding comments for you. I'll let Jean, <laughs> sure. I'll let Jean have some. Um, I mean, I'll stay on forever, but I asked Jean and Heather to give us to 830. Um, so I want to be, be respectful for that. Um, um, but Heather, uh, how about some closing comments from you? And then we'll let Mr. Nickel close us out. Sure. So a couple of things that I'll try to wrap together the advice for this, the 16 year old or you know what could what teenagers could do, um, as well as other people. Um, so I highly recommend um, finding uh, there's been some excellent books written about uh, sort of sociological um, perspectives, journalist uh, investigative journalism. Um, there's been one recently that's gotten a fair amount of press called Invisible Child. Um, I heard an interview with the um, author who is a, a journalist. Uh, for the New York Times. It sounds, I haven't read it yet, but I've read the excerpts that have been printed in the Times. It, it's powerful, powerful writing. So even if you can't, you know, firsthand, you know, sort of experience it, um, there are definitely ways to sort of get the idea in your head. Um, another good one, um, famous now, is Evicted by Matthew Desmond. Um, so just, you know, read what you can. For those who can run for school board, um, local government, this is a great way to influence policies on the ground, right? So I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir there. Um, you know, know who's running for school board. I was ignorant for a long time. I don't have kids. That's a very basic thing. Who is on your local school board? Um, I think for kids, you know, volunteering somewhere, um, going to a, a food pantry, working in a food pantry in a kitchen, um, something like that. Um, so get them out of their comfort zone can be a real eye opener. Um, so those are just a few ideas. And really, I think really doing anything is better than not doing doing nothing, right? So no matter what, what your interest, no matter what your approach, no matter how you go at it, doing something is always a much bigger improvement over nothing at all. And with that, I will turn it to Gene. Uh, let me be real quick. I'm gonna just say uh, four quick things uh, that I've learned uh, in the last two decades. Um, first, simply, the level of hardship experienced by our sisters and brothers in North Carolina, all over the state, is far more pronounced 
than most of us understand. Uh, and the more you study it, uh, the more that becomes the case. Second, in every county of North Carolina, every corner, there are astonishing people working against the odds as volunteers, uh, out of churches, out of nonprofits, trying to better the plight of those fellows. Um, the way I put it, if Mother Teresa were alive and living in North Carolina, she would not feel lonely. Uh, third, if you could line up all of those people doing all that great charitable work, that great humane and selfless work, they would all, and we put them in a room here, they'd all say this, no matter how much we do, no matter how hard we hustle, you cannot make up the gap between what needs to be done and what we can provide. If they were being fancy like Augustine, they'd say that charity cannot make up for the want of justice. And fourth, every one of those people in that room would also say this, no matter what you read in the paper, no matter what they say down in the state house, every year it's getting worse, not better. That's the challenge we face, those four things. And I think we ought to all carry it with us. Um, Thanks a lot for letting me. Uh, I don't know how we could have had a better presentation tonight. Um, Jean and Heather, the data is stunning. It is powerful. It is compelling and it compels all of us, I hope, to, um, to get involved more in this issue and to share this information and to, um, to do everything that you can, as everyone has said here. Get educated, read talk to your legislators, talk to people who might want to run for office, attend the local school boards, attend your county commission meetings. Uh, county commissioner meetings are where money, money is going, being spent as well, not just at the state um, level. Um, talk to your, your congressional uh, folks. Um, leave no stone unturned. And, you know, honestly, um, one step forward, you know, I, I, we know there's a lot of leaders in our world and in our country, in our state, and in our churches, in our communities, our synagogues that inspire us. Look to them to, to keep motivating us because we really cannot um, give up. So I just want to share a few closing things. I, I wish that um, I could keep Jean and Heather online forever. I wish, I hope I can get them to come back sometime and follow up. But um, in the meantime, I want to tell you about a couple of quick things really fast. Um, if, you'll, if you'll let me just three minutes and you can hang up on me. We are going to be talking about, whoops, whoops. I don't know what you, okay. We are going to have a couple of webinars coming up I want to bring to your attention. One of the things that are going on in our public schools right now is that we are having a really hard time. We, having, we don't have enough social workers. They are overworked. They're overburdened. They're also quitting just as teachers are. We need to really pay attention and support our, our social workers. As I say, needed more than ever. I started my career as a social worker, shared that with Jean earlier in Cumberland County and it forever changed my life and made me want to have a more just and world around me. Um, and I encourage you to come. We have some great speakers. Um, also, we're going to follow that workshop up um, the next week after we're having actual school social workers from all across the county in a workshop. I want you to hear from them, their joys, their concerns, um, their successes. Um, these are the folks that are keeping our kids in school every day, getting them places to live and food and taking, getting them to school, actually. So, and then the last thing I want to bring to your attention is March 24th. We're having a program on special education in crisis. Um, we are in a crisis mode in North Carolina. We have special ed classes with no special ed teachers in them at all. We have some classes where they should have 12 children and they've doubled to 24 because there's no teacher. Um, we have um, uh, some classes where the, the teaching aid, this instructional aid, the teacher's aid, whatever you call it, is the teacher because we can't have any certified folks. And we're not, um, our legislature has literally um, turned a deaf ear to some of these issues that are happening for our most needy children um, who also have a, an ethical, moral, legal 
constitutional right to a sound uh, basic education. Um, all of you have taught, heard me earlier, please go to our YouTube channel, click on videos. There's tons of stuff there where we talk about school psychologists, social workers, Leandro. This will be on there um, as soon as we can get it up there in the next day or two. Uh, so please do it. And honestly, um, we are just a small nonprofit and we are working out of our passion and we want you to join us. It helps us when you like our page and when you, you know, follow us on all these social media, it helps us get our information out and it helps us when we talk to folks who want to give us some funding, right? If we, they think we have some reach, it helps us. So here's how you can get up with Terrence and me, email us. We um, will do anything we can to accommodate you. We're happy to meet with your group to do a presentation on Leandro on the legislature on this issue, just um, email us and, and uh, we'll be happy to do it. Once again, from the very, very bottom of my heart, uh, thank you to Jean Nichol, who is an inspiration to me. He's one of the really good men in this state, y'all. And we don't have a lot of strong people with strong voices who are speaking up. And Jean, you never back down. You're such a courageous um, person in everything that you do. I'm so so appreciative of you being here. And Heather, what a joy to meet that you and to learn of your research and to know that Jean has a good partner in <laughs> pushing forward um, all of this research and information. Um, Heather, you're remarkable and all of your thoughts and your comments tonight show what a scholar and, and a thoughtful, loving human being you are. So thank you for being here too. Terrence, thanks for helping me out. And to everybody, good night and safe. If you're out, be safe this weekend and um, be thinking about our kids and think of something you can do to change a child's life. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, good night everybody. Good night. Good night. Bye.